All right, so um, I have a real long outline, but um, I'm not going to go through it. That actually is a context for some of the things I'll say. So if you want to know more, you can read that outline. And I am just going to um, make some general comments at the beginning and make a connection uh, for what it means to us. So I mean, as we know, last week we were talking about, or rather, Roberts Lairdon was talking about spirit and soul and body. I said I was going to make some reference to that. I'm actually making a decision not to go into that very deeply. And the reason is, is I'm impressed with the small amount of time that we have to be exposed to the word of God. And I, uh, I think there was things in that, in that talk that was worthy of reflection. But I wanted to spin off from that because I think the things I'm going to say actually have preeminence over just discussing and looking deeply in what we were presented with last week but I will make some reference like right now. One of the things I want to say by way of uh, clarification is that if you weren't aware of this already, it's not like we're made up of three parts, that there's the spirit part and there's the body part of Jordan and then there's the soul part of Jordan. Um, that's, that's not the case. We are one person before the Lord. And for purposes of uh, wondering about this mystery, we may use the terms spirit, soul, and body, but, you know, really, to be honest, the human being is a mystery. We really don't know. We can't really define what a human being is apart from seeing him from the vantage point of God because God created us. How could we actually be created in, in the image and likeness of God? How could we actually be having a, a spirit created that's life and is a part of who we are is our identity. It's actually the core of our identity that given to us by God. What does that look like? How do you, how do you feel about that? How do you see that? And the, and the truth is, is that um, as one theologian in the early church was talking to someone else about the Trinity and, explain, and you know, he wanted to know the mystery and the person responded, when you, when you can explain what a human being is, then I'll explain to you who God is. <laughs> and because the mystery is actually similar because we were made in the image and likeness of God. And we know enough. And so there is a part that we call our spirit. But if we were to look at it, each one is a circumscribed circle in the circle. So it looks like one circle, but there's three circles. Does that help? Not really. But there's something about who we are that is a composite. And there are some dynamics uh, that we can point to that helps us maybe begin to wonder and, uh, about this mystery of our, our creation. And chiefly, I want to focus on the human spirit. I mean, that is our heart. That is, that is uh, the, ba the root of our desires are, come from our spirit. The spirit is our identity. Now, that doesn't mean that our body isn't involved because, you know, our body is going to be risen. There will be a day when we will actually have a resurrected body. And those who die now before the resurrection are incomplete. So the body is not just an earth suit or something you throw away. Because I look at the right hand of God and I see a man. Yeah. I see someone who has a body. It's filled with the Spirit of God. But that is the prototype. That's where we're to be. And God has given us his spirit so that we can be, begin to see who we are and what we're supposed to be about. Our spirits can perceive things that are given to us as a gift. We call it our grace or a power from the Holy Spirit. God's desire is that we be filled with the spirit of God in the same way that Jesus was and is. The standard for humanity is Jesus in his resurrected body. So we as the people of God 
that's that center of our being, that, that, uh, the thing that we, we long for. That's rooted in our spirit. We're, what we are looking for in life, this, this longing, we know that we have to become complete and we don't know how to do that and we know nothing on the earth that we could construe through our own efforts. Whatever, fill that, fill the void that only God himself could fill. So we, every person is born with a thirst and a hunger for something more than just living, for something more than just living with a lot of money, for something more than living and having every material dream fulfilled. There's just something more than that. And we know that in our spirit, but we can't say why, except, well, we're made in the image and likeness of God, and until there's something about that, that is sealed in the presence of God himself by the Holy Spirit, we're going to feel not quite complete. So the Spirit is what is what telling us what to look for, for meaning. And there's a way that in Christ Jesus, that Spirit has been transformed by the energy of the Holy Spirit so similar to Adam and Eve when, they, when Adam had no life, and, but God breathed into Adam, breathed his spirit into Adam, and he became alive. And then when he turned to himself and said of to God, when he began to love other things more than he loved God, when he was more interested in other things than God, he was deadened in his spirit. And he couldn't have the fellowship with God that he once had. And that's the story. If we give our spirit, the core of our being, our heart of heart, to something else other than God, there will be a deadness there, a numbness. Our blood won't circulate right, to put it that way. And we won't see things accurately. And we'll be easily deceived about what life's about. And we'll plug other things in. But that will have a catastrophic effect on our ability to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Because if I can use this analogy, and please forgive me because it's so incomplete in many ways, but it communicates some aspect of sensitivity. If we were to look at our spirit and say like it's an antenna to pick up why we're here, or we would say who God is and what he's asking of us, it would be centered on our spirit. And that spirit gets cultivated by what we give our spirit to. So in other words, unlike maybe some of the analogies that we were presented with the other week, our spirit can be messed up. It could be recreated. And when in that recreation in Christ, we do all of a sudden see things we didn't see before. We know God in a way we didn't know before. We do have new desires and impulses that we didn't have before. You know, and, it's, uh, and we have this joy and we have this actually presence of God, which is called peace, and that's on us, and that's all, that's all wonderful. But the scriptures is really clear that that can be muddied and that can be dampened as we, if we do the same thing that Adam and Eve did and we turn our hearts away from Jesus and being like him and we have other goals that take first place. So when the teacher says, so what do you want to be when you grow up? And then someone says, I want to be a doctor, I want to be an actor, I want to be a lawyer, I don't know, just a teacher, or whatever. Um, we would say, take me back, back to the future. Now you're an eight-year-old. And we'd say, I want to be like Jesus. That's my goal in life, teacher. That's what I'm about. That's more than a career for me. It defines my life. And they'll say, wow, what an intelligent little boy you are. <laughs> but it's okay, we can say that now, and we can be intelligent young women and young men or older men or older women or however you all happen to be. <laughs> yeah. So the point is, the reason that we get in not really pursuing Jesus as the end is our antenna 
has actually, we've tuned in to other frequencies for entertainment, for stimulus, for in, encouragement and engagement. And so it's like that, that station that's kind of half in and half off. And, and then the person says, it sounds like that. You can't quite get the words. And then what I would say, well, just tune it in. Tune it in. And so somebody, sometimes it could be just off the station completely. And maybe you're on an entirely other station. The antenna wasn't meant to receive those messages, but that's what we're looking for. So one of the key things of that protects us and that encourages us is that we need to make a resolve from the very beginning. Teacher, great teacher, Lord Jesus, I want to be just like you. That's the aim of my life. It's not my religion, and it's not a cause. It's a divine person who has shown up himself to communicate to me the Father's love and gives a revelation of the whole reason for meaning and what life is all about. It's all about him. It's all about pursuing a deeper intimacy with him and knowing him in a way that goes beyond the intellect but goes right into the spirit that changes us from the inside, and we will have to say, wow, that's supernatural, that's beyond what I studied for, that's more than what I could ever work for, it's God. Yeah. But the key thing that helps us is, when we're tuning in that station, we're only gonna try to listen for Jesus. Even though sometimes it may not be coming in well, it may not be coming in well because we're not, we don't know how to tune it in. But the first way that you'll do this, if you say, I don't care how long it takes, I'm going on to that station. If it means I have to get a new antenna, I'll get a new antenna. If I have to go closer to where the broadcast is, I'm going to hear this voice. That is my aim in life, to hear the voice, and unlike this radio analogy, to hear his voice so I can respond. Because all of us know this enough. When you hear the voice of the Lord, it gives you such great joy. And then when you can respond to that voice, it gives you even greater joy. Because just then, you've come closer to the broadcast, come closer to the Lord's lips, and you can begin to see his eyes. And then you realize, yes, he is not just the means of salvation, which is wonderful, but really greater than what we even think when we say salvation. He's life itself. Life itself, not just when we die, but life right now. Yeah. But we have to be clear at the very beginning that our life is not about our job. It's not about our family. It's not about things that other desires, we want to make sure that there's no other desire higher than his desire for us. And the Spirit of God can give us that grace. The Lord is, makes it really clear to us, seek and you will find. Not you hope to find, you will find. Knock. That means you're going to take the, some effort, you know, to move closer, you're going to actually, you see the door and you're going to knock. And you're going to wait for it to be opened because it says, and it will be opened. Ask and you will receive. These are promises based on God's character. Not even your faith as you would understand it. Because see, your faith is only faith because you know God is faithful. So your faith is actually his faith. Because you don't, because I knock on the door of someone who I know loves me, I'm not going to say, I don't know if they're going to answer because I don't know if I knocked well enough. <laughs> as long as they heard the knock, I just can wait. It's up to him to open the door or her to open the door, right? That's the way it is with God. So many times we don't get answers because we think it's too much on us. But Jesus said, had the faith of God. Or, have, or act like God is faithful. Yeah. Yeah. So when you ask, you'll receive. So I'm going to share some things. 
uh, from the book of Revelation. But I want to make this clear that God gives us everything we need and it is a gift. It's called grace. I'm going to share some things and some people might think, oh my goodness, I think I'm far away. And I want to say, that's okay. Because God will make up any distance. In fact, if you can know that you're far away, that's a sign of health. It's those who think that, hey, you know what? I don't really need anything from God. In fact, the question was posed to us once, what do you need from God? And so numbers of people can't immediately know what that is. And that's, not, that's kind of a dangerous place to be because you should know immediately what the, what the answer is because your whole life is about seeking God and knowing him. So what do you need if that was your aim? What do you need from God if your whole life is about seeking to know him better than you do now? What if it was possible that you could be exactly like Jesus? That you could have, indeed, manifestations of the Spirit the way that he did? Of course, the truth is that numbers of people have had experiences like that. And that just gives us encouragement to even go farther. But on the basis of God's character, when you hear the words I'm going to share, and you might notice the distance, know that he is full of grace. He will give you whatever you need. You just never thought of two things. One, that really your life aim was to be like Jesus, for real, honestly. That's your life, teacher, like Jesus. That's what I want to be about. That's my whole life. Nothing else even comes close. Secondly, it's all about grace and asking him. That it's a matter of asking him like you really want this and he will give it to you. So I want to look at, um, I want to look at uh, the book of Revelation. I want to look at particularly chapter 3. I'm going to go through this briefly. There's a lot of preface to that, which I can't go through, through to, with you today because we uh, don't have the present paradigm to actually go through the word of God in the way that I would like to, but someday we will. In any case, this is the lesson from Laodicea, so it's in the fir- third chapter of the book of Revelation, and um, if you have your Bible, or uh, you can turn to that now, and we'll look at Revelations 3, starting at verse 14. So it begins this way. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. A few things. The word is used, the phrase true witness is used more than once to refer to Jesus. And what that meant is he actually presented faithfully who the Father was. You could really know who the Father was because everything that he was asked of the Father to be and do, he did by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Yes, even in Jesus' life, he was dependent on the Holy Spirit, just like you and I. And the Holy Spirit and and Jesus' love for the Father and for others allowed the Spirit of God to do this powerful work so that, as the author of Hebrews, Hebrews could say, Jesus was the exact representation and perfect image and radiance of the Father. So when Philip could ask Jesus, show us the Father, and it's enough for us, and Jesus is saying, have you been with me so long, and haven't you understand that I and the Father are one? And brothers and sisters, now listen to this. This is amazing, but it's the truth. Someday you can say, when someone says, well, who is Jesus? And you could say, isn't my life telling you who Jesus is? And they won't think you're proud or arrogant. They say, oh, that's why you're so kind. That's why you're so generous. That's why you're so patient. That's why you you say things that I know aren't just from your own mind, but it's like God is speaking to you. And you'd say, yes. And he can offer that to you too. 
So he is a true witness. And so he's now speaking, when he says beginning of God's creation, in this context, he's talking about the new creation. Through Jesus, God has created a people to bear witness of him. And so now he's inspecting these churches. Do you look like me? That's what he's saying. Brothers and sisters, yeah, this deals with the church of Laodicea, and this deals with every church that would say the name of Jesus and say, we are the church of Christ. Every name, every church that's named after the name of Jesus, Jesus is taking a look and evaluating. And if we're close enough to him, we'll hear an evaluation, and that's a good thing. It won't be like, I have no idea what he thinks about our church. That tells you that something is deadened. It is appropriate for us to ask, and it's appropriate for us to know. And so in this case, Jesus reveals himself to his church in Laodicea. And so, verse 15, I know you works, that you are neither hot, neither cold nor hot. Would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. So what this passage is referring to, I believe, is talking about the sources of water that was received in Laodicea. In the, in the situation with Colossus, they, had, they were hooked into a, a well that would give fresh water for drinking. And people would, would revel in that water. It was like they felt like they were alive when they drank the water. It was so refreshing, maybe like a mountain stream or something of that nature. That's a very, very cold water. And then there was a case in Heropolis, which wasn't that far away from um, Laodicea, that they had hot water coming from uh, hot springs, which people would soak in for healing. And numbers of people were healed. I don't know if it was joints or what, what the nature of all that was, but they were known as healing waters. So you could see in this case, Jesus is saying, I can see the value in cold, fresh water and I can see the value in hot water that could actually bring healing. But in this case, you got both coming in the same place, which is lukewarm. And that, Jesus says, is something that I find very, very sad and sickening. He's actually ill with it. And what this is a reference to, it says, I look at your works and I discern that. Now let me clarify this. Jesus is not judging people based on what they do. This is a way of speaking of that time that sometimes we're not plugged into accurately. The works is referred to is like, you could put it in this way, the way your life works. What you look like. It's not like they're doing a project and, oh, you're just kind of like half-baked with it. You're not all in and you should be all in into it. It's not like that. It's talking about, you see, they can say many things about Jesus by how they look, by what excites them, by what they're into, the hours put in, what they give their attention to, how they define themselves. In this case, Part of it was defining themselves around their wealth, which we'll see in a moment. And they borrowed probably the imagery in the Old Testament, which was if you have an abundance of wealth, that's a sign that God is with you. That's it, like Abraham was so blessed. And, and there is a truth there, but how they viewed this truth was distorted. They thought that was an imprimatur and seal that they're doing okay and better okay, actually, better than most. But they thought that about their spiritual life, mostly. They thought they were in decent shape or more. And so Jesus says, I see how you approach me, and I don't look like that is something that you really have given your whole life to. In fact, there's good reason to think, as was common in that culture, many people were a part of guilds. That, like, that is, like if they were, were a stonemason, there'd be a certain guild for that. If there was a, a certain way where you worked with uh, things like pottery uh, or some kind of artisan, whether it's uh, building a wall, 
that uh, so uh, this, that you would you would be a part of this kind of little group of people who would have celebrations and have dinners and they would bury people and um, that was a service they gave to people that met, were members of their guild and everyone was a part of a guild and if you weren't a part of a guild you were kind of on the out and there's nothing I can really think of right off the top of my mind that is analogous today but somehow if you're a part of that culture you're a part of a guild now the problem was they regularly gave uh, honor and reverence to idols now numbers of people were mixed about that they thought well that's no big deal we don't need to believe this but this is what we do and that's probably how the Laodiceans viewed it you know these people are important people in my life you know I don't agree with everything about them but I don't want to say no to them because they're gonna think I'm hostile to them or I'm not really I'm setting myself off from them and I don't want to do that so odds are they probably gave sacrifices in these guilds so they were understood as they're part of the system but they said they were Christians they're followers of Christ but that was a huge compromise now brothers and sisters in our culture there are ways that your employer way that your teachers maybe even your parents request an allegiance that only Jesus himself deserves yeah. yeah you may not be putting incense in the altar but you may be giving yourself away in ways that actually hurt your conscience or they did it first that messes up your your ability to pick up the signal from God because now you're listening to the voice of men and women of authority and you're giving them more honor than you did the voice of the Lord that leads us to the state of the church the way it is today which I spoke about a couple weeks ago you cannot give any loyalty to things that are asking of you your time your money your energy your attention that you know deserves first place into God and you might say well, what am I supposed to do seek me and you'll find me ask and you'll receive that itself is an honor that you would say Lord I don't want to be like the Laodiceans I want my spirit to receive your voice loud and clear and I want to be able to respond to that voice so I will and that was Paul's attitude he said I'm reaching forward to the call upward call of God in Christ anything else is like dung compared to knowing Jesus compared with the honor to share his sufferings compared to what he has for my life read Philippians 3 17 and forward or 7 to 17 and you'll see his attitude I'd like to go through that but that's a sermon in itself but that shows you a man who's resolved you know it's not like you have to be an apostle like Paul but you do have to be single-minded like Paul because there is no such thing as a disciple who is double-minded but if you think you're double-minded well God bless you because then you got light so ask the Holy Spirit for help and he'll give you the grace to be single-minded if you think everything is great for me even I come before the Lord and I'm saying okay Lord I'm saying you are my Lord and I'm thinking there are ways that I do not manifest the Lordship of Christ that I think that I could I don't manifest his glory his power and his love the way I think I could so Lord reveal to me how I can say a larger yes reveal to me my biases that I don't see that I've been encultured to think that it's okay to give Jesus part-time because you see in the kingdom of God everybody's full-time because we're sons of God daughters of God called by God what an honor what a blessing that is what a privilege what a gift indescribable and God's looking at Laodicea and he says you don't look like that and I'm sad in fact he says 
It says, in some translations, I'll spit you out of my mouth. In some, in some translations, it says, I vomit you out of my mouth. Really, in the Greek, it communicates you're violently sick. And it's a violent vomit. It's like a projectile vomit. <coughs> I don't want you in my life or in me at all. Not that he doesn't want it. I shouldn't say that. But that's just not, it's not me. This isn't me. I don't want anyone to think it's me. And so con some commentators say he was saddened, this true witness, because where they could have offered living water, they didn't offer anything. Where they could have offered healing, they didn't heal anyone. Where they could have been a light, where they could have actually given vision to other people, they themselves lost their own vision. And my whole plan for the church was they would be so in love with me and see that I am indeed worthy of their love, that they themselves would become love. That's the call of the church. That is the call of the church. And that people who are a part of this community of God that Jesus is looking for are people who can see that. And so their antenna, their spirit is always saying, Lord, I want to love you more though. I love you, but I want to love you more. And I see the need, and it makes sense to me. Because you are so beautiful, so generous, so wonderful. I can't be content with any less than the confidence in my spirit that you have it all. So, <clears throat> verse 17, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Now again, they're not, they're not all saying, I have prospered, <laughs> I need nothing. But the way they look, it's like, you know, they got everything pretty good. And so, we're definitely more than okay. Now, most Christians, for instance, are unaware of this. I think numbers of Christians would like to be aware of this, and their lives would change just by being aware of this, which is their resolve is to be just like Jesus. And they're not being poetic, and they're not being overdramatic. They're thinking, that's what God has in mind. And if you read my outline, I'll give you scriptures and passages that make it really clear the call to follow Christ is a call to be apprenticed by the Spirit of God in the community of God to become just like Jesus. Because there's no higher call than that. And we have not been honored with anything so great as that, other than that. So, Jesus is saying to them that they don't even know that they're called of God anymore. They don't know that is their call. They don't seem to act like it. Again, we can say this to ourselves. It's what we're living. It tells us what we desire. It's what we're living that tells us what is it forming us one way or the other. And since we are people, right, we are people who want to be zealous for God. We say, Holy Spirit, have at it. Bring light where there's darkness. I want to change. Ah, if we're there, there's hope. If, there, if we're there, the Spirit of God comes in quickly to help us and change us. If we're there, even in the process, we'll have joy in repenting. And a person who thinks they don't have to repent at all, the joy that they have by pursuing other pursuits will be nothing in comparison to the one who has given themselves to believe God is who he says he is and that he will give me more than I can ask or think and he will help me in my anemic state to bear a more adequate witness to him. Isn't that true? Yes, the Holy Spirit is a helper. One come alongside to help. So he tells them, don't pollute your spirit with other gods. So we need to ask the Holy Spirit, is there something like that going on? Because I don't want it. 
And if you, if you pray that prayer, that's the proof the Spirit of God is active in you. That's the proof. Because people who aren't born again don't care about that. But it's us who are of the Spirit, we care about that. So we want to know more. Verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself in the shame of your nakedness, and may, may, not, may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, that you may see. So this is interesting. He's saying, okay, you're invested in other things that have made you blind and naked, and that as a result, you actually are shameful. Your testimony is shameful. It's like Jesus said, right after the commandment of discipleship, if you're afraid to testify of me in this adulterous and sinful generation, when the Son of Man returns, he will be ashamed of you. And this is kind of that spirit that's coming through there. It says those who gather with him are of him, and those who do not gather are not. And so this word is coming alive in a congregation. Brothers and sisters, he ends this by saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So I'm praying, and I hope you're praying with me, that the Spirit of God be able to speak to us, and we say, Lord, bring it on, please. Show us. Teach us. Help us. Because we want to give you glory. We don't want to live for ourselves, and we don't want people to be confused in our presence who is Lord. Yeah. We want them to see the one whom we've seen. So, so, they're saying, so the Lord is saying to them, I want you to pay attention here. You can't serve two masters, and that's what's going on. You're kind of socially acceptable, but you're not acceptable in the kingdom. That's always the temptation of the contemporary church. The church is kind of, the present day church in the West is devised so that you can live your life for other things and still be a good church member. And that is something that's intolerable and actually contradicts the reality of what Jesus sees as the church. And people can't be helped that way. So he says, to show my righteousness, to be clothed with my righteousness, is really what he's saying, as it says that later on in the passage. And the point is this. This is a good analogy. Okay, if you were naked, I mean, you had no clothes. You don't even have a drape to put around you. You literally have no clothes. There's just nothing of cloth in your house. <laughs> and you got to go out. Do you think you'd find a way to get clothes? You think, nah, it's okay, I'm okay. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, no way am I going to just streak forever the rest of my life. Just walk in the, and I'm walking in the garage, I'm walking in the grocery store, <laughs> saying hi to people. You know, you'll be put in prison, we think. Um, so that's like, no way. So you're like, okay, like you get that. Okay, so all of a sudden you wake up and you're blind. You're thinking, ah, it'll go away. It's okay. I can still feel things. That should be good enough. No, you think, I'm blind. What am I going to do? I can't see. I need some help. i got to call somebody. Somebody's got to take me to a doctor, you know, an optetrician at least. <laughs> Hopefully an ophthalmologist. But anyway, you're not going to be settled with that. So if you think that you actually could see, and someone tells you how you could see, and said, you know what, I used to be blind, and this is how I see. You'd say, tell me about that, yeah. right? You wouldn't say, I'll get around to it. <laughs> You're getting a sense of what he's talking about, repentance? This is really important. When you see it's really important, then you make action. And that's what Jesus is saying here. I want you to invest yourself in me, because I'm the remedy, that you could bear witness of me. 19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. So because he loves, 
See, this is the thing. If people don't know what to repent of, then you got to say, well, it's not on God's part because he just loves you. So if you're not getting any message about how you can become closer and you're okay with that, you're okay to be nude, blind, then you've got to ask for special grace to come to your senses. So it's like the prodigal son that we read about yesterday. He's eating pig slop, and he's thinking, or he's considering eating pig slop because he's thinking it's better than nothing. But then he comes to himself, it says, or he comes to his senses. That's what we want the Holy Spirit to do with us. Come to our senses. Who is Jesus anyway? What kind of life does he deserve? What kind of life can he provide? Is he for all eternity? You know, God has shown up. So I was talking with someone that I told him that I used to teach philosophy. And uh, I said, you know, like questions, like I like to entertain questions like, what's the point of our life? And he said, uh, well, that would be a good question. That would be, be good to find out. And of course, the reality is, if God shows up in the flesh, and that's true, you got a lot of answers about why you're here. Yeah. Yeah. That should sear us and bring life to us. And we should say, I want to I wanna make sure they understand that. By, by looking, at, looking at me and how I even repent, not my perfection, but how that I zealously repent, like it's really important to me because I know God well enough that I care. You see, the greatest sign of death is just not caring. So that's why if you have some kind of, you know, if you've been in an accident and, and uh, you, you might say your appendage doesn't quite work right, the doctor will take a pin and, and stick a needle in there to see if you can feel anything. If you can't feel anything, that means there pretty could be some nerve damage that could foretell even greater damage. But if you go, ouch, that means your nerves are probably okay. We want to be very sensitive. We don't want to have to have a pin stuck into us. The word of God spoken to us is enough. Because it's the word of God. So, the Lord says, I love you, therefore I must correct you. I love you, therefore I must teach you. We know that parents hate their children when they don't correct them or teach them. And hate is the biblical word, means they just don't care. I mean, you can always correct and discipline in a wrong manner, but correction and discipline. Discipline comes from the root word that means training. The Lord wants to train us. So he's looking at them, and you know what he's saying? He's saying, I want to see you on my throne with me. And the way you are now, you have strayed very, very far away from that vision. And my church is to be helping people enter into that vision. So get clothed, get healed, Live in a way that honors me, and you will become honorable. The more we honor the Lord, we become honorable. It just happens naturally. Because we are those who have been honored. Receive my glory and reject the glory of the world. Be misunderstood. It's okay. Be persecuted. It's okay. It's a sign that you're alive to something else. Have difficulties because of your union with Christ and your allegiance to him. That's good. All those who are godly in Christ Jesus, Paul says, will be persecuted. So then verse 20, the famous a verse that's used for evangelistic purposes for people who are not in Christ. We have to understand the context is that passage was talking about the church, Laodicea. 
and maybe talking about the church today. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. So what does this mean? It's just awesome what it means. I mean, it's, it's shocking. It means that Jesus is actually outside the church and he has to knock. He's not in the church, he's outside the church. That's what this whole message is about. I'm knocking right now, calling you to repentance. Let me in. Their compromise has squeezed him out, has thrown him out. You, you know, it's like we, we, we don't, can't see how you can really be compatible with what we're pursuing, Jesus. So you're, you're just out. And so Jesus doesn't give up because of his love. So he knocks. He's the one who knocks. Revelation 3.21. The one who conquers, the one who pushes against all those things that would push against you, which, brothers and sisters, that is the meaning of the word persecute. So in other words, like your employer, your boss, your parents could persecute you and not have a whip or, you know, a bat or not be swearing at you or kicking you. They could just squeeze you. That's the sense of persecute, pressure. Put pressure on you to yield. And the pressure in that society was working till ill purposes, making this, this people gradually push Jesus out the door. And then he ends, verse 22, he was ear, has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So here's a chance for us to tune our spirits with the Spirit of God. Do we hear this as the voice of the Lord? Not just for this moment, but will it recalibrate and reorient the major decisions in our life, what we do with our time, how we spend our money, Brothers and sisters, I'm not quantifying these things, like you should only spend so much or you have to spend this amount of time. I'm using these things as an analogy for the word works, the manner of your life. Because at the core, what Jesus is caring about is your attentiveness and my attentiveness and my intention. What do I see is the point of life? What do I see is the point of my life? to be as close to him as possible. I know there are ways I could give testimony to God that would make the difference between life and death in other people's lives. And I know God is gracious. That means that he gives, not because I worked at it, but because I just want it. Because I see the need. And I believe him enough to know that he's generous. So since I know he's generous, I will seek and I will find. That's his promise. I will ask and I will receive. That's his promise. Anything I pray according to the will of God, John says, I can have a confidence that he will give me the request that I have asked of him. Jesus says to his disciples, until now you have asked for nothing. Ask for me and I'll give you whatever you need, whatever you wish. These aren't platitudes. Jesus really meant this. So he could actually talk to the church this way. We might think it's stern, but read really the reality is these people are stern. These people are cold. These people are cruel. Because God's arms are constantly outreached to them. And they act like, it doesn't, like he doesn't have his arms extended. As if he won't really help them. And he doesn't care. And that's the thing that God does not want any church to give testimony to. Because... The sin of omission is negligence, is taking for granted the generosity of God. Not taking advantage, but taking for granted the generosity of God. God wants us to take, uh, God wants us to take advantage of his grace. So, even in a week, to pursue God, to make the investment, like I'm blind or naked, or like I'm deathly ill. And the Lord says, I'm going to heal you. I'm going to give you whatever you need. Or to say even to the Lord, Lord, I care. I care about you. 
I care about other people. And I know that you're the true and faithful witness and my call in the upward call is to be a true and faithful witness just like you. And you've provided for me. Like even today with this word, you've provided for me. So I can come to my senses. And I don't have to stay there with the pigs. Then I know that I've received the pearl that deserves to be honored and treasured, not thrown to the pigs. And the Lord has invested himself in us because he loves us. Now the Lord wants to give us courage. He wants us to be bold in our pursuit of him. He wants us to give him the opportunity to show himself strong in the midst of our weakness. He wants us to give a testimony that when you ask God, he really does provide an answer. More than you could ask or think. That's the testimony we could provide the world. So even in our process, we could show them a God who is interactive and personal and engaged with us. And a God who cares about us and about others. And we want to give him honor. He deserves honor. And you know, honor is just a good word for love. It means, you know, you might dress in a certain way to show someone honor. When you give a gift, you can give a gift in a way that shows honor. Maybe you, you knew what they wanted, and, and, you, and, you present, and maybe it cost you a lot, but you still wanted to give that as a, an expression of you honoring the relationship. And, of course, you receive that, and you receive the honor from that person. And Jesus is saying, I've given you everything. I've given you the kingdom. I promise things to you. That I haven't promised to others. Well, I promised to everyone, but they don't know that I promised the promises I've given. And I want you to know you have everything. And so our response is, Jesus, I know that's true. Thank you for showing me that. I will never be content with where I am today. Not because you don't love me or accept me. It has nothing to do with that. Did you know God equally loves? They, God loves so much that you can't sin enough to change his mind. And he also can't change his mind by doing good enough. He loves you equally either way. But that's not the point. The point is, what about our love? Don't we want to love him back? That's part of growing up. To love him back. You see, he sees a throne in our future. You could read some of those passages in Revelation that talks about sharing his throne and sharing authority to rule over peoples. And he's definitely referring to the people who are redeemed. You could look at that. It's amazing. I don't know what that means. But I don't think I'm ready for that. I don't think I could rule like Jesus. Protecting, caring for those that are under my charge the way he is. A nation, a group of people. I mean, in a regal fashion. We just don't know what's ahead of us. But if we've seen God show up in the flesh, you've got to know that whatever is going to be revealed is consummate to who he has revealed himself in the incarnation. You're going to see that it fits. Oh, we've been so ennobled and given such an amazing gift. And the church at least could act like that. And the Lord could help us. So let's just close in a brief prayer. Holy Spirit, I pray that you seal these words in our hearts. And I hope and I pray that you would bring these to our remembrance. Spirit of God, Jesus said that you would be given to us, that your words could be kept in our remembrance. We want to remember these words, not as words, but as your expression of love and an invitation to go deeper in you. Lord, by grace and in faith and your faithfulness, we resolve that we'll be closer to you each day because we'll ask for that. We resolve that your will and your heart for us will be increasingly realized each day because we'll trust you for that. Because, Lord, we care. And so, Lord, let it be known, whatever you want, whatever you would ask, and whatever you see in us that might flinch, take care of that. Yeah. Because we do not agree with that. We agree with you. Yeah. Spirit of God, you're able. If you're able to give order out of the chaos and create the heavens and the earth, your spirit can certainly order our hearts 
so they can love the way they were meant to love. We thank you for hearing this, and we thank you for answering it. And we will give you praise and thanksgiving in our process, knowing that you are answering it, because this is what we want to be when we grow up. This is how you've ordained it to be. In Jesus, amen. amen. Um, two weeks ago during worship, the Lord gave me a word, and I thought it was more personal at the time, but I'm going to share it because I think it would encourage everyone. He said, Rachel, I'm really not hard to find. I am where I said I would be. I'm in my house. Um, if you are seeking and not finding, you're just looking not at my house. Hmm. But the invitation is here, like just just come back on into the house. Yeah. Just come back in here. Leave that other stuff. Just come back in. Um, and I'm like, yeah, that's true. And he's like, remember, I don't hide myself. Yeah. The only time it looks like I'm hiding is when you're looking somewhere that's not my house. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Amen. So. Yep. Yeah, I just, um, <clears throat> pardon me. I just think as you sat there and just let the Lord take a sharing and a word like this deeper into your spirit. You just realized, as Ethan said, how much peace and joy you've been missing out on if you're approaching it from a way where, well, great, here's this list again. <laughs> how are we going to, it's like, it's not on me. And that's not saying I don't, I have a responsibility to orient my heart mm -hmm. towards the Lord. But then as, as Ethan said, I can ask. And I can expect to receive. I'm not hoping. I'm asking. And he is going to Amen. do what he said he's going to do. So if he's knocking at the door, but you have a heart to listen, you open that door and just chase him. That grace abounds. And the Lord is going to grow. Yep. And so. Amen. I think that this is. Well. Say it. I think this is just a reiteration of everything that is this working? Wow, yes it is. <laughs> I think this is a reiteration of everything everyone's been saying, but sometimes it can seem really daunting um, when you don't feel close to the Lord to spend that time and it can feel like a chore as much as I don't want to attach that word to it, but to know that He is there regardless of whether or not you feel he's there um, or you feel encouraged in those moments, um, he's patiently waiting and he will patiently wait. Um, and these things don't have to feel um, discouraging. They're encouraging um, because he's patient with us. And he's faithful. So he... so. Sometimes we have the image of thinking that we have to run, run after him. But actually, if we take a step, he takes two steps toward us. But we have to take a step, not because he's, he's not generous, but he, but he wants to know that he's working with our will. And, that, and we can't offer him hardly anything, but we can offer him our will. So he doesn't want to take that gift away from us so that we can know in our heart of hearts Yes, Lord, I did choose you. See, I'm walking toward you. And then he gives even more grace as he walks closer to us. Not, not commensurate with just our little walk, but he'll take many steps, actually, to move closer to us. That's the way he is. But in the mystery of how God has made us, given what we will have to be about for eternity, there's a way that he wants to, to train us so that we learn how to love, and that is... For us, the extending of our will toward him. And then he'll, he'll, he'll make up the distance. We just have the confidence that, you know, he's going to be more generous than us and that, and that his love is greater than us. So he certainly will respond if we take step toward him, step toward him. He just, he just needs and we just need that confirmation that that's where our heart's at.
you, you may not connect it, but I, I do, with as we take this word seriously, as we honor the word, it really is the beginning of a revival. Because it's really getting realigned with his, his, the agenda of his heart and the purpose for our creation and what he wants to do in the earth through his people. This is exactly what revival is supposed to be about, a people continually growing in the grace of God and manifesting his presence as we respond to his love. And if we can have that as a part of our way of life, it means that it will grow in intensity each year. So it's a, it's a very important word, and it's a gift. And so we, we, it'd be good, of course, for us, our soul and our spirit, to open up the gift, to sit with the Lord with the gift, and to wait on him for a further word. Knowing that waiting is not like waiting in absence, but it's waiting in his presence. And that he actually will do the internal changes that are necessary by the fact that we would even wait and not rush by. Yeah. That we say it's important enough for us just to wait in his presence. That's an expression of our love and faith. And he will always meet that. As soon as we do that, he'll be present. And he will do a work inside of us that we could never do. Okay, well, that's enough to think about and pray about for the week and for life, actually. So um, 